It's May 25th, 1977, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So on this day, the legend goes, in the streets of China, you could see people queuing up to buy copies of the nation's favourite Shakespeare play. Oh, which is what? I'm already excited to guess. It might surprise you <laughs> It's not you Troilus and Cressida. It's no. not Timon of Athens. Hamlet. <laughs> Got to be Hamlet. I'm getting very different levels of Shakespeare familiarity from these responses. <laughs> <laughs> Arian's heard of Hamlet. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. The correct answer was The Merchant of Venice. Wow. And that was following an 11 year ban on William Shakespeare, put in place in 1966 during the Cultural Revolution by Jiang Xing, also known as Madame Mao, who was the culture secretary and Chairman Mao's wife. She deemed Shakespeare a bourgeois counter revolutionary. Which is odd because. If there's one thing that my English degree from Oxford taught me, <laughs> there's not many things. But one of the things it taught me was that you can read Shakespeare in an infinite number of ways. And like of all playwrights ever, basically, you know, his importance to the language is such, his narratives are already embedded in popular culture such, that actually you can say, yeah, this is about slavery. Yeah, this is about suppressed homosexuality. You know, so why didn't they just say, oh, the history plays... They're about how the monarchy's bad and we should all have communism. But that's almost the annoying thing about how Shakespeare is performed in the contemporary world. It's like you can layer any single thing onto any single play. So here is a history play, but actually we're going to update it so that it's about the future. And you're like, OK, on one level, yes, you can make it work. But I'm so irritated with seeing like Richard yes, II. Yes, Ian McKellen, on one level, you can make it work. Richard III is a fascist. <laughs> Go and take your strange ideas somewhere else. Well, you know, ironically, that that actually in the early years of the communist regime, the they were all for it in China. They they liked Shakespeare. Karl Marx was a big fan of Shakespeare, and so the early Chinese Marxists were also big fans of Shakespeare. The popular plays were stuff like Twelfth Night and Much Do About Nothing that had, you know, they were quite feminist for Elizabethan drama. They weren't overly political. And then I think it's exactly what you were saying, Ollie, about the different ways Shakespeare can be performed. That was actually the problem, is that any kind of art that had interpretation was not very Ooh. welcome under the Maoist regime. Yes. Mao famously said that n there was no such thing as art for art's sake and that all art was made for a certain class. And obviously most of it was not art that he approved of, as you can tell by the fact that China had eight approved operas that could be performed during the Cultural Revolution. But consequently also, under the early communists, the bulk of the literature translations of Shakespeare had actually come from the former Soviet Union. So they all had these like built-in uh, Marxist, Leninist values. So apparently, there, King Lee, it was described as a portrayal of the shaken economic foundations of feudal society. <laughs> and Romeo and Juliet, according to the sort of reinterpretation via Marx, is the desire of the bourgeoisie to shake off the yoke of the feudal code of ethics, which uh, is a different version to the one that I saw Baz Luhrmann Was it the Baz Luhrmann one, Arian? Is that what <laughs> that was doing the rounds in Australia? I got there first. I got there first. <laughs> well, a lot of Shakespeare is about minorities, isn't it? And, and their position in society. Yeah, so interestingly, um, in China, those things are minimalised a lot because China obviously views itself as a homogenous society, they will really downplay, like they won't have Othello played by a black actor or, or they won't have Shylock's Jewishness being a central part just because it's not seen as like necessarily culturally relevant. Apparently the figure of Portia in Merchant of Venice is seen as like the core of the play because she stands for justice, which is something that's like more in line with the tradition in Chinese theatre, which you know is very like centred around virtues and things like that. But Shakespeare has actually become really sanctioned by the Chinese state. Um, when Premier Xi came to the UK for his state visit in 2015. He quoted from The Tempest. He received a copy of Shakespeare's sonnets as a gift from the Queen. Yeah, it's a bit safer, isn't it, than quoting from the Rolling Stones? <laughs> and that's the thing. It's and there's also a very peculiar, very Chinese form of tribute to Shakespeare now. In the southeastern city of Fuzhou, they're currently building precise replicas of the homes where Shakespeare was born and died. I don't know if you've seen, this is something that's gone on all over China. There's a mini Paris in the city of Hangzhou, there's Thames Town. Have you seen pictures of that in Shanghai? Oh, what a I go. haven't. I'm fascinated. Whenever anyone recreates anything that's supposedly British in a place that so totally isn't, I always find that absolutely fascinating. You know, whether it's Gibraltar, which is a real country, <laughs> or <laughs> Harry Potter world, it's always discombobulating as a Brit walking around. 
I've always quite wanted to go to the, the Venice in Las Vegas, which looks so tawdry and plastic and awful. And consequently, I want to be there. I've been. You've been. It's so great. I'll tell you what's great is the roof. You look up and the clouds on the roof with air conditioning units between them. I'm not going to say better than Venice, but like memorable. <laughs> More air conditioned. Better than Venice in summer. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> uh, I hadn't heard about that, Rebecca, but what are they intending to do with it? I mean... It's not a theme park, it's a museum, what is it? Uh, it's not a theme park or a museum. In fact, they are actual just housing developments. And the funny thing is, is that you, you could easily fall into the trap of thinking, oh, look, this is like a, an alien culture that is like interpreting our culture in a way that they think is like really cool, but actually looks really cheesy to us. But actually, the residents really dislike it on the whole. There's been quite a few reports from this mini Paris, etc. And the people who live there think it looks really tacky and awful. Yeah, I mean, if I was living on an estate in Hertfordshire and one of the houses was built to look like it was in Shanghai, I would find that quite weird. I'm also not sure I'd want to live in the house that Shakespeare either lived or died in. Mm. No, I agree. Did you know that Shakespeare is actually, according to a report for the British Council, more popular and better understood overseas than he is back in the UK? And this survey that was done a couple of years ago of 18,000 people across 15 countries revealed the following interesting statistics. Mm -hmm. 88% of surveyed Mexicans like Shakespeare as opposed to 59% of British people. 84% of Brazilians said they found him relevant to today's world as opposed to 57% of the UK. Of course Mexicans understand Shakespeare better than British people because when they translate it into Spanish they don't translate it into a form of Spanish that the average person cannot understand do they not i was curious about that yeah are they, is there not a sort of spanish equivalent of thou and thee and thus no it's much easier to read european languages from that period of time to a modern person than it is for us to do it with english because english mm. has generally i can't speak for all european languages but it's really easy to read french plays for instance but it's also the age you're introduced to it at isn't it like in mm. britain at primary school you're given some shakespeare and then a lot of people struggle with it and then they hate him forever without ever really reviewing that whereas i presume if you're mexican or brazilian you're probably 16 and it's probably a romeo and juliet so of course you can relate to that there's probably also some cultural stuff because apparently the nations with the lowest scores were Germany, who only 44% of people liked him, and France, 51% of people liked Shakespeare, which the council decided was possibly a reflection of the fact that Voltaire described Shakespeare's works as an enormous dunghill, which probably sounds quite sophisticated in the original French. Now, do any of you remember Shakespeare's Way with Words by One True Voice, winners of Pop Stars The Rivals? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no? I suggest you go and check it out. Um, it's uh, an incredible little little tune, which I think is the reason why we've all heard of the uh, runners-up from that competition, Girls Aloud, and not One True Voice, who were the why? boy band who actually won. They've come back to me in a flash. It's just appalling. Are you going to sing it for us or not? Because I feel that's what you're building up to. It's so bad that I actually can't sing it because like, the tune is not memorable. Um, but the, <laughs> the lyrics... I mean, I just think if you're going to mention Shakespeare in a song, you have to really have lyrical integrity above all else. Do you know what I mean? Like, the credibility, especially if you're talking about his poetic nature, then I think in the poetry of the lyrics, there needs to be some art. But I'll, I'll give you a sample. And this did get to number 10 in the UK charts. If I had Shakespeare's way with words, I would write a sonnet, put your name upon it. How can I be heard? In my heart I am a poet, don't know how to show it, if only I had Shakespeare's way with words. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't it? The show at Poet is a classic. Amazing. The tune is coming to me now. I, I think I rem- actually remember that one. You can be my Juliet and I promise you no regrets. I mean, apparently they seem to think Shakespeare shagged Juliet. That's not what happened. <laughs> I think they can get away with everything on the basis that they start with, I don't have Shakespeare's way with words. Yes. Mm. So it's kind of like, if yeah, it's, it's as if the song's called, I'm a Philistine. Here's an example yeah. of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but it was, uh, and here's a fun fact you can have for free. Written by 80s pop star from the Stock Aiken and Waterman stable. Guess away. Mm. Mm. Sunita. No, good guess, though, because of the closeness with Simon Cowell. Arian? Uh, what's his name? Rick, Rick Rowling. Rick, Rick Astley. <laughs> it was Rick Astley. Was that oh my complete God. stab in the dark? Yeah. Oh, my God. I'm sure. Arian, you've been listening to his new album. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Actually... <laughs> I don't mind Latter-day Rick Astley by any means, but uh, yeah, this is a bit of a shocker. But there you are. That's astonishing. That will never come up on a jukebox or even on like an ironised playlist on MTV, so you'll never get to use this fact. But if ever in a pub and you want a fact, 
Rick Astley wrote Shakespeare's Way with Words for One True Voice. There you go. Love it. <laughs> Tomorrow. It really was amazing. I, I was there and it's giving me goosebumps again to a little bit relive it. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.